Good evening. Hi, Pam. Hi. That's just you and me, I think. Oh, okay. Oh, now Renee. Greetings. Renee is usually the first one on. Hope everybody's doing well today. Oh, That's the Litchfields. Litchfields from Tennessee. How's the weather down in Tennessee? My brother got six inches of snow. Was it yesterday or the day before? Trying to move was six inches of snow. Mm. That was in Colorado. Well, we are going to be in John's Gospel tonight. We're going to look at chapter 8, verse 12 and following. Maybe get all the way down to verse 30 is my goal. Hi, Catherine and Judy. Josh, who else is coming on? So got some rain here. I don't know if you guys got rain in Hannibal or Tennessee. But, 75 uh, today in Tennessee. 75 in Tennessee. Nice. We had that last week. Hi, Paul. Yeah, we had uh, good weather last week, but say I'm not complaining, are you? So mm -hmm. COVID numbers are up around here. And um, so we'll be making an announcement. Uh, the governor came out with a new mandate. And so we'll be letting you know in the next day or two. So, um, what our plans are. Uh, the mandate was uh, 25 and above. Uh, so a gathering of 25 people and above mandatory mask. Of course, we had a mandatory mask in our first service, highly recommended in our second service. So not a lot would change for us. We've been trying to take all the safe protocols. And as always, anybody feels compromised, uh, by all means, watch us online. Um, you can stay in your pajamas and watch us online. And, um, you got to take those precautions, especially those who have underlying issues. And uh, But we do have two services right now. We don't know what the future holds, but for right now, we're going to um, continue with that. So first service, mandatory mask, we're looking at, uh, well, the governor mandated 25 and above, so that would include our second service uh, as well. So, yeah, want to follow Follow those guidelines, but we'll be sending out an email to everybody. I've had a couple of people call me, and I'm sure I'd continue to get some calls, so I thought I'd just let everybody know. So we've been trying to, all the way through this, um, continue to minister the best way we can. And uh, we're glad you're here with us tonight on Facebook Live as we look at uh, John's Gospel together. I'm sure some others, other folks will be uh, coming in. Catherine said they had a rainy day, too. Rainy day, so... Mm -hmm. Well, we are still following up with Jesus is in Jerusalem at the Feast of Booths or Feast of Tabernacles, this annual feast that was a requirement. It was to celebrate God's faithfulness in the past. It was one of their also harvest festivals, um, but it was highlighting God's faithfulness in bringing uh, the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt into the promised land. God was with them, did miracles, provided for them. Uh, we saw last time or two weeks ago the water ceremony that they would have been doing because God uh, imagined all these people needing water. Water, we have to have water to live. And Jesus says, I'm the living water. And if you come to me, you'll have rivers of living water, right? Let me just turn over there. So he who believes in me, this is John 7, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will, flows of, will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus stands up during the ceremony when they would be pouring out water, reminding all the Israelites of the history of God providing for them life-giving water, especially during the wilderness journey. And Jesus stands up and says, if anybody is thirsty, verse 37, let them come to me and drink. So we celebrate that because if you're here tonight, if you're on tonight and you've trusted in Christ, that has happened to you, right? The Holy Spirit has come in and produces all the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all of that. And so we did a whole um, hour, basically, 45 minutes on that issue. We're still at that feast. It's coming to an end. And they also had a light ceremony. Why is that? Pillar of fire by night. And so the Jews had these large, some of the readings that I've done, 30-foot uh, 
Imagine these 30-foot menorahs filled with oil and lit up. With that. Imagine the temple, all of the beautiful edifice and everything that's going on. And when they would do this light ceremony, Jesus stands up and he says this in chapter 8, verse 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So we're going to open up with that text and read on down uh, with our time tonight, but let's go ahead and pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks once again that we get to meet online and study your word. We thank you uh, once again for not remaining in darkness, not remaining hidden. We're thankful that we can see your existence through what has been made in the world. Uh, but if that's all we had, we'd still be lost. Thank you for your special revelation through your word. Um, most of all, through the word who became flesh, the Lord Jesus, who we're studying tonight. We pray that you would open our eyes to uh, savingly believe in him and to follow him all the days of our life. And we thank you that we who have experienced his saving grace get to walk with a newness to how we can view the world. and We're no longer in darkness. We pray if anyone comes on tonight or later uh, that you would open up their spiritual eyes, call them out of darkness into your light where they can experience your salvation and follow you. And uh, so bless our time tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So uh, I want you to think about how important light is. Not only imagine first century, all they had was what? Oil lamps, right? Or, or how many of you like bonfires? But imagine having... Not having, right now in our house, we have a lot of lights on, right? Mm -hmm. How about you guys? Uh, maybe you drove home tonight, you had your headlights on, you got a porch light, you have a kitchen light, bedroom lights, hallway light. We're in our basement, we have lights. Uh, you have flashlights all around. And, and I want you to think about this, how important light is. Imagine, I thought about starting off tonight with all the lights off, right? Just imagine turning all your lights off, trying to get around in uh, complete darkness. And Jesus is using not only the light ceremony that they were doing, but now is speaking metaphorically, right? Think about how powerful this statement is, okay? So they're doing this festival. They're lighting these big lamps and uh, celebrating. And Jesus stands up and he says, I'm the light of the world. Not just the light for Israel, but the light for the world, I am. So notice that throughout the Gospel of John, John is highlighting what's called the I am statements. What have we already seen? Can you think of any? I'm the, done. <laughs> I'm the living water. Yeah, um, I'm, the water I'm, the, I'm the bread of heaven, chapter six. Uh, yeah. I am the bread of, of heaven. I came down from heaven, right? So we're going to see I'm the vine. We're going to see, I'm the door to the sheep. In John chapter 10, we're going to see, I'm the good shepherd. And so I'm going to develop that a little bit tonight of how important that is. You know, we read this, I am, and we, we don't catch it like the Jewish people would have caught it. So tonight, we're going to get into that. But imagine how radical that is. Imagine any mere human being saying, if my wife started going around this week in town saying, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows after me, they're not going to be in darkness anymore. Um, I might sign her in somewhere and vice versa, right? I mean, that is a, would you say it's an arrogant statement? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty arrogant, isn't it? For us, if one of us said that. Yeah. But imagine how that sounds. How, how, how would have that, imagine you're, you know, you're at the festival and somebody stands up and says that. But if you've been listening to Jesus, this guy is not only not just teaching, what has he already done? He's, he's already been doing signs that pointed out, they're, they're called authenticating signs. They authenticate who he is. And so if you start seeing somebody raised from the dead, a man born blind, he now sees, that's going to be chapter nine. We saw a guy who had been lame, wasn't able to walk for 38 years. Uh, he now walks. So you would start saying, okay, I'm following this guy. So when he makes a radical statement like this, you're like, this makes sense. Everything that we have seen about him. And for those of you who have trusted in Christ, you know 
what it's like to experience salvation, that you go from darkness to light, right? I know for me, I never thought about God, sin, any of this stuff. And when I became a Christian, it was a whole new way to look at the world. It's like the light came on. And sometimes we just, I think sometimes we just take it for granted, the light we do have to see through moral issues and and to have a sense of meaning and purpose and uh, the reality of God. Not only where do we come from, but I mean, the big questions of life, where are we going and all of that, we we get to experience it when we come to know Christ. And um, when you're around people that don't know Christ and it's like they're clueless, to what you're talking about. Remember, right now, they're in, they're in spiritual darkness. And so if we were to go throughout the New Testament, like, like in the book of Colossians, it, it says God has transferred us from the, th- from the domain of darkness, what? And in, into the kingdom of light and into the kingdom of his beloved son. Uh, we have Paul in, in the book of Acts chapter 26, where the Lord, where Paul's saying, you know, the Lord said that I'm going to go and and uh, preach the gospel and see people leave the domain of darkness and come into the light, those type of things. So when you think of this, I'm the light of the world. So that's the statement. Look what he says. What's the condition? Well, let's, let's read it and think about what he's saying. He or she, he who follows me, will not walk in darkness. So what's the condition? You have to follow him. You have to follow him in order to get the result. We'll not walk in darkness, but the contrast is what? But we'll have the light of life. So in John chapter 12, verse 46, so if you're in John 8, just flip over to the right for a second. In John chapter 12, look at verse 46. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. So what do you have to do in order to be able to get the result? You have to believe in him. And it's it's a continual following. So the condition is he who follows me. In John 14, 46, those who believe in me. If you believe in the Lord Jesus, you're not going to walk in darkness. You're, you're going to be able to, to see things more clearly. And, and I just want you to this week to think about how important light is to you. Every time you see lights, now we don't carry around flashlights really, do we? Unless the power goes out. But just think about all the lights you have on in, in, on in your house. The light on your phone, the light on your computer, the light wherever you go, how important it is. And how, if, when you walk around at night, you ever stub your toe? I have. Pam speaks in French when she stubs her toe. I, I never knew you knew French I didn't know or some foreign language. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No, in darkness, we stumble around. We hit our, right? The spiritual darkness is what he's talking about. Now, we could camp on that and just meditate on it all night. That's my big takeaway for tonight. For you to thank God that you're no longer in darkness, that you're, you get to see because of Jesus coming into your life and, and shining his light, his illuminating the world for you. And he's, he's the light of the world. world. He's the light for everyone, not just for a small group in Palestine, the Jewish people, and now are spread throughout the world. Not just for Asians, for everyone. No matter what ethnic background, no matter where you live, everybody needs Christ, or you're going to remain in darkness. And that's not the only bold claims that Jesus is going to make tonight. Now, you could think of some other verses in the Old Testament. Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation, right? Something like that. Let me turn over there. Psalm, uh, Psalm 20, did I say Psalm 27? Let me see real quick. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? So you add that with all these other references to God and light in the Old Testament and God following the, uh, leading the Israelite people at night by this pillar of fire, and they were to celebrate this festival, right? And so um, they're lighting these large lamps, and Jesus says this. It's an amazing statement. And it, it starts another dialogue. So let's look at the dialogue now. So the Pharisee said to him, 
you are testifying about yourself. Your, your testimony is not true. Your testimony is not true. And in a, in a way, you could understand them saying this. These are, these are bold statements. Of course, what's the ultimate proof? The resurrection. His resurrection, right? Um, but right now, they should have believed in him because he's been teaching. He's already proved who he was through what he has said and uh, his miracles. So watch what Jesus says. Jesus answered, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. Here's the basis. For I know where I came from and where I am going. Here's the contrast. But you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. So what is the basis of Jesus saying, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true for this reason. I have full self-awareness of where I came from and where I'm going. What's the problem with humans? We don't know the future. We, we are limited. We are corrupt. We're, to live in darkness is, is, right? We're born sinners, and then we, we voluntarily live in, we live in sin, but we're spiritually in bondage and darkness until we come into the light of Christ and experience that new birth. And so he's speaking to people who are still in darkness right right now. And he's saying, look, um, I can't testify about myself right now. Do you know why? Because I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you don't. So just be quiet. <laughs> I mean, if you listen to Jesus, through, right now he's mild. He's combating their arguments, right? And later, we're not going to get to it tonight, but you read the rest of chapter 8, it gets a little heated. Okay? Both ways. So Jesus is in this dialogue, this, this debate format, if you will, at, at different times. It can, be, it can be mild and interchanging, and they're trying to entrap him in words and, and catch a little statement here or there and take it out of context. And right, that's what they're try, they've been trying to do is to get him arrested here and to do away with him, um, but very wisely and with grace, and, um, which tells us when Jesus even gets sharp, it's still gracious. So let's remember that. You judge according to the flesh. I'm not, right now, I'm not judging anyone, right? The five, chapter three, we saw this. The Father didn't send me into the world to judge the world right now, right? To what? I came on a saving mission. John 3, what, 17? Let me just turn over there. We all know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Verse 17, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Oh, catch this. Here's a darkness statement, verse 19. This is a judgment that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for the fear that their deeds might be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. But this, this whole idea, I didn't come right now this first time to judge the world. It's not my purpose in coming this time, but to save the world. But even in this passage, we see this darkness light uh, contrasted there. So, so let's go back to John 8, because we could chase these rabbits all day, these, these different texts that connect to each other. You Okay, so you guys judge according to the flesh. Jesus doesn't. Because he says, even if I do judge, verse 16, my judgment's true. Why? For, whenever you see for, all the way through, a lot of times it's, it's on the basis of, or and it's an explanatory for. So, even if I were to judge, it's true. I'm not alone in it. I and the Father who sent me. And he. this is used throughout the Gospel of John. Jesus constantly says this. Even in your law, it's been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself. Why can he do that? Because I know where I'm from. I know where I'm going. I have self-awareness of who I am, where I came from, where I'm going. And the Father who sent me testifies about me, verse 18. So they were saying to him, 
well, where is your father? And Jesus said, you neither, uh, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. No one seized him because his hour had not yet come. That's another key phrase. How come they couldn't seize him? His hour hadn't yet come. He comes later in John 17, John 12, John 17. What's he say? The last night? Come. Right. The day before he's crucified, Father, the hour has come for you to glorify the Son. So that's John 17. So right now the hour hasn't come. So even though they want to catch him and kill him, seize him, they couldn't because his hour had not yet come. But notice he spoke these words in the treasury. He taught in the temple. So we're this, no doubt here's the temple ceremony going on. He makes this grand statement. They're having this dialogue right then and there. Can you picture it? Pretty, pretty tense stuff, right? Because this idea that you can't ever get into a debate, but listen, folks, important things get debated. Important things where there's disagreements. I don't know where you're at politically. Can I talk about politics just for a second? Well, you're like, you will any? I'm just saying, I mean, what politics, I mean, even though, yes, people can overdo it, but people are going to debate all kinds of things in life. Why? Because truth matters. So people, when you have differences of opinion, you are going to debate things. You should be able to. Now, some things are just purely subjective. I don't care. Like Pam says, I like, I like Rocky Road ice cream, personally. What do you like? Peanut butter and chocolate. Yeah. And moose tracks and other stuff. My kids like, they've always liked uh, chocolate chip mint. I can't stand chocolate chip mint. But who cares? Because we're, we're, those are very subjective things like ice cream or color of a car. So can you separate subjective things with real truth claims that matter? I hope you can. And so if somebody says you're around family, you know, we're coming to the holidays and, you know, Uncle Joe says, you know what? I think all roads lead to heaven. Maybe you have an aunt named Oprah who says something like that. Well, you know, getting to heaven is kind of like getting to Philadelphia. There are a lot of roads that lead there. That's the way heaven is. And you're like, I can't let that go. Well, you know, Jesus, so you take it off your shoulders and put it on Jesus' shoulders. You say, well, Jesus said he was. Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through him. And he proved it by his own resurrection from the dead. So I'm going to trust in him. Truth claims. And here's the thing. Where are you getting your truth claims from? Uncle Joe? Coworker Joe? Whoever it might be. And most of the time, what is it? Their own ideas. It's their own ideas. It's just what I think. What's that based on? Is it based on anything? At least I'm basing it on... Eyewitness accounts, God's word. John was an eyewitness of Jesus. I'm reading his words where he's going to be crucified. He's going to be raised from the dead. I don't know about you. I mean, listen, if somebody made these extraordinary claims and said he was going to be handed over to be spit upon, mocked, crucified, and on the third day he would rise again, that's exactly what happened. All these men were willing to die for it. This teaching turned the world upside down and has continued to transform lives for 2,000 years. So yeah, we're going to have to speak up. Somebody makes a statement. Well, you know, I just think as long as you're a pretty good person, that's what most, a lot of people believe that. What are you going to say? So, do we get some scales out? and you add all your good versus the bad? Well, yeah, that's kind of what I believe. Well, the Bible says nothing like that. The Bible says all have sinned. Oh, I agree everybody's sinned, but you know, God kind of grades on a curve. That's not what the Bible says. And we're going to get down into that. Let's keep reading. He said, I will, verse 21, I go away and you're going to seek me. You will die in your sin. You will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you can't come. And he was saying again to them, you're from below, I'm from above. You're from this world. I'm not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. 
Do you want to die in your sins? Uncle Joe? Or whoever we're talking to? And we're not saying it from any moral or spiritual authority in and of ourselves, are we? No, we, we are like Uncle Joe, right? Look, Uncle Joe knows what you were like before you became a Christian. Just say, yeah, I, I admit. I'm, I'm not basing it on any, any moral quality of myself or any spiritual quality in myself. I'm basing it on somebody outside myself, some other objective authority like Jesus, right? Like God's word, something outside of myself. And here Jesus says, people do die in their sins. Unless you believe that I am, Jesus is saying. And here's where it gets interesting. This word, I am, they're going to catch on to. But notice, how do you die in your sins? We don't believe in Jesus. You, we, we've all sinned, and if we die with these sins, Jesus here has, has been offered as the only Savior, Right? The message of reconciliation, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. We have a ministry of reconciliation. We, we, Paul says, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Why? He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. We're ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg of you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Listen to this. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We're asking people, look, this is the only way to be reconciled to God. This great exchange. He who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. But if you don't believe in him, then, then guess what remains with you? You die in your sins. Now, is this worth defending? Or do we just say, yeah, it doesn't matter. You know what's worse? If you as a Christian say, yeah, it's just my personal belief. And Uncle Joe says, yeah, if it works good for you. And you say, yeah, it works for me. That's not what we're saying. I'm not saying that it just works for me. We're saying... Joe, you need it. I love you. I care about you. So, what does this, unless you believe that I am, a go, in the Greek, it's a go I meet. Now, if you keep your finger in John 8, turn over to Isaiah, or you can just listen. Yep, flip about in the middle of your Bible to Isaiah 43. Now, there are a lot of scriptures in the Hebrew Old Testament where I could point you to, but this is probably the clearest. Isaiah 43, 10. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, so that you know, you may know and believe in me and understand that I am he. Before me, there is no God formed. After me, there, there's not going to be any. Um, verse 13, even from eternity, I am he. Uh, verse 25, I, I'm the one who wipes out your transgression. This, this Hebrew, when, it, when the Hebrew was translated into Greek, it's ego, I, me. I believe Jesus is picking up on Isaiah 43, verse 10, verse 13, uh, verse 25. Also, uh, Exodus, if you want to turn over to Exodus, remember when Moses was going to try and lead the people out of Israel. And he's like, God, I, who do I even say you are? And God says, this is Exodus uh, chapter 3, verse 14. I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am. I am the self-existent one. And Jesus comes along and he says that. Now, turn back over to John chapter 8, verse chapter 8 for a second. I want to show you where it comes to a very heated point. So they get into a big dialogue, which we'll look at next week. And Jesus in verse 56 says, your, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. And the Jews said, you're not even 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. Why? Why? Because he said before Abraham was born, 
ego, I me. They knew what he was claiming. Look, Jesus's enemies knew exactly who he was claim, claiming to be. In John chapter 10, they say, we're, we're stoning you. Um, where Jesus makes some other radical statements, and Jew, okay. Jews picked up uh, stones, verse 31, to throw at him again. And Jesus said, I showed you many good works from the Father. Which of these are you stoning me? And they said, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a mere man, make yourself out to be God. You being a mere man. So all these statements um, throughout the Gospel of John made them irritated. Jesus is at a home and he forgives a man. And, and the Jew, this is Mark chapter 2. And some Jews sitting there say, who can forgive sins like that but God alone? So all of these indirect claims. And now Jesus is saying to them, you're going to die in your sins. Do you know there's some watching tonight that will probably die in their sins? They continue to, we pray not, we hope not. All of us know people like this. They don't want to think about these things. They don't want to think about who Jesus is. And when you try and talk to them, they, they don't want to. And it's like, wait, why can't we even talk about it? Why can't we? Talk? I just, what's your view of life? How do we get here? Where are we going? Who was this man named Jesus? Have you even read the gospel accounts? Uh, the Bible's written by men. You're right. It was. Men inspired by God. So John, John followed Jesus for three years. Matthew followed Jesus from three years. So, Uncle Joe, just I believe John was inspired by God. He was with Jesus for three years. But just read it as a, any other piece of literature. Why don't you just read about Jesus then, Uncle Joe? Read Matthew's account. Read John's account. Read Luke's account. Luke was not a direct follower at first. He was a physician that checked Christianity out became a follower, and he said he went and investigated everything carefully. That's how Luke starts out his letter, Luke chapter 1. Inasmuch as many undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. It seemed fitting for me as well as having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you. So read, read Luke. So I would just challenge, you know, this is a good time of year as you have conversations to invite people because if you believe these words of Jesus, then you know people that are going to die in their sins unless they come to believe in who Jesus really is. And listen, it's not going to be enough for them to say, I believe he was a good guy. I know a lot of people say, yeah, you know, Jesus, he's probably a cool dude that, uh, Spoke some wise things, but I, I don't believe in his claims of deity. I don't. I can't call him the Son of God, the Eternal Son of God. Who? No. Think I can appropriate some of his teachings? And well, then you're not believing in Jesus and who he claims to be. Because Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So you must come to grips with that. So read about him. I'm going to pray for you. Can I pray for you? Can we talk about this? So, verse 24 is pretty powerful. And we're going to see it more, okay? We're going to see the claims uh, continue throughout the Gospel of John. So they were saying to them, him, who are you? <laughs> and Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? Verse 25, what have I been saying? I mean, we've been over this. I mean, who are who do you claim to be? Who are you? What, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Je so Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. I can do nothing on my own initiative. Why does Jesus keep bringing that up? He wants to confront them with he's God. They yeah. Believe that. And also, why does he keep bringing up, um, why does he keep saying this? I don't say this just on myself, but also my father who sent me. He keeps bringing that up. Because in the Old you, Testament, we read it too. What yeah. And saying? also, the, you know, the one who you call father, uh, he's the one who sent me. Okay. And I do everything that pleases him. That's what he says in verse 29. 
When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that please him. Verse 29. And what's interesting is, it says, when he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. But we're going to see next week that it was purely fickle faith. Oh, I believe. And by the end of it, they want to kill him. They want to kill him. So I'm going to leave some... uh, time tonight to have a little dialogue if you want or any comments because I really hate to get into um, the rest of the text. I kind of like to finish that next week. Okay? So the claim tonight, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. Condition? He who believes in me, he who follows me. So John 8 12, he who follows me will not, here's the promise, here's the result, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, or 12, 46, he who believes in me. So believing, following, Jesus isn't calling for one time, belief, commitment, no. It's, and when you come to believe in Jesus, it's like I'm coming to, to believe in Jesus, recognize I'm a sinner, trusting that he died on the cross on my behalf and rose again. Jesus, I want to trust my life to you right now willing to turn from doing life my way to trust and follow you as Lord and Savior. And that following is how long, Pam? Till you're with him. Till you're with him, lifelong. Persevere till the end. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lifelong following him. And the result is, so he who follows me, he or she who follows me, that's a condition. So Jesus is the light of the world, but you have to appropriate him personally. You have to believe in him personally. And the result is, you're not going to walk in darkness. Transfers us. So. Can you, can I ask a question? Yeah, no. Can you Sorry, explain my voice 21 changed. a little better? Verse 21. Because I thought if you sought him, and you, then you would find him. And it says, you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Yeah. Does it, it mean seek him physically? Well, he's going, all right, so he does this a few different times. He'll hint that he's going away. Later, he's going to say, uh, where I go, like he's going to die. Right. I and the, the, so when he dies, I'm going away and you will seek me. I go away and you will seek me and will die in your sins. Where I'm going, you can't come. Where's he going? To heaven. Unless they come to believe in him. But it acts like they will seek him. So does it mean, because I thought it, the Bible said, if you seek him, you will find him. If you seek with him with all of your heart. So I guess I'm confused. I go away. You will seek me. So when he when he dies, they're, they're seeking him, right? Physically. No, I mean they're seeking to yeah, physically they're they're okay. seeking to kill him, right? So they're, they're not really they're, spiritually seeking him. No. Okay. I mean, so they're constantly ready to kill him, right? And so where where was the verse tonight where we saw that um, his hour had not yet come? Where is that? We just saw it tonight. Mm-hmm. Where's that, folks? We just read it tonight. Um, Oh, 20. Yeah, they couldn't seize him because this hour had not yet come. So all the way through his ministry, it it keeps getting heated up all the way to the end. Once he dies, they can't go there. You're going to die. And and then look at verse 24. That's why I said to you, you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Okay, gotcha. We, I mean, so one of the takeaways also tonight is this idea that we can't get in, in dialogue that ends up getting a little, little heated. At, we want to always keep it peaceful, right? Keep it peaceful, cool. But let's admit, sometimes we... we we get to talking with people just like with Jesus, and it, it can get stepped up. Are you telling me that if I don't believe in Jesus, I'm going to hell? Have you ever, I mean, something like that in front of a bunch of, Pam knows that, and a bunch of family members around, and I'm like, Dad, or, or Johnny, or whoever, why are you getting mad at me? Jesus is the one who said it. Check it out. Check it out. Just check out what he says, John 14, 6. John 3, 16. If you don't believe, you stand judged already. I, I'm, I'm giving you an offer. I'm giving you an offer to take this. 
You come to Jesus, things will be different. Eternal life given, a new way to see the world. You have to, you have to hold true to what Scripture says. And that's why sometimes it causes a division, even though you don't want it to happen. You want to continue to love people and be kind no matter what. Love people. I still love you. I love you more than I did before. Respect them. Honor them. But you can't water down the truth. And people want to put you on the spot. And at times in front of others, right, they they really want to make a fool of you. And so sometimes they'll bring it up and you know, he believes or she believes this. And, and just as graciously as you can, right? You, just, you have to put it back on the Lord's shoulders and just stand. Look, it's not my opinion. I didn't come up with this. I've even said that. I, I didn't come up with it. I want to be faithful to what Jesus said. He said you will die in your sins unless you come to believe that he is. So don't shrink back from that. How many of you, you're, you're just made, you, you might say, well, my wife and kids, they love to talk about personality differences. Um, Enneagram. Enneagram. Does anybody here know what I'm talking about? And um, some personalities are just, you know, they struggle with at times having to deal with anything controversial. And so they just, you know. And you might say there's, there is a time and a place. Maybe yours is more one-on-one when you talk with somebody, uh, but sometimes you just can't avoid it, right? So, I mean, you just can't, the, the question. And we're going to fail. How many of you have failed at witnessing or you've blown it before, right? Many. Yeah, right? Um, so you just, you keep at it. You keep praying, you keep loving people. But so tonight, aren't you glad? Can you, can you leave tonight with this one great truth? This is messy as life can get, right? We have no idea what the future holds for any of us that are on here tonight. But if you know Christ, you know that you're not going to die in your sins. And you know that you have light. You have light to see in this world. You under, right? You understand certain spiritual truths. Um, and just, if, if that's what you need tonight to walk away with that truth, um, praise the Lord. So next week, keep, keep reading. We're going to finish John chapter 8 next week. And... Um, <laughs> it gets really interesting, these this next section. And uh, it gets a little heated. And what's this, what does this tell us about Jesus? Jesus was perfect, never sinned. Um, and yet he could dialogue like this. You and I, we, we are going to mess it up at times, right? We're, we may let our emotions get the best of us. And we just need to repent. Say, I'm sorry. Right? Say that to somebody. Look, you know what? The other day, I'm sorry. We, we got a little heated or whatever. And see, some people are saying, yeah, that's why you should never talk about that. Okay, so let's just, what, talk about daisies every day? We're just going to talk about the weather every day? How many get bored? I mean, it's okay to talk about that kind of stuff. But there are eternal life-changing truths out there. And so we can't, we can't avoid certain topics. So... Any closing thoughts, Pammy? Mm -mm. Any other thoughts tonight? I can't really see on my phone very well. Nobody put a question in. Yeah. Are you thankful tonight that you're no longer, that Christ is the light of the world? That he has blazed a trail and he, he is, I mean, just as he came the first time, he will return the next, second time. And the second time, what does he come as? King of kings. He, he comes to judge, to judge righteously, to set up his kingdom. So in the second, in the second coming, there's all kinds of judgment language. He comes to sit on his glorious throne and judge the nations, it says. So there, in that aspect, first time he came, came on a saving mission, died for sins. Second time, he, he's coming back in, in powerful glory, and he's going to render judgment. But if you know him, you're on his side, and uh, it, it's, a great, it, it's a great feeling. It's a great, a great way to just know that no matter how bad it gets, no matter how dark it gets, 
no matter what kind of diagnosis you get, that if you know him, it's going to be all right. So, well, let's close in prayer, shall we? Lord, we give you thanks once again for your word. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the light of the world. Thank you for calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. And uh, we thank you for that life change that that is, um, that if we follow you, we don't have to walk in darkness. And uh, we pray that we would not be ashamed of your claims, that we wouldn't shrink back from telling others about them. And we know a lot of people um, that will die with their sins, and we have the saving message. Um, so we pray that we'd be able to, to do that, this time of the year especially, um, that we would take those opportunities to graciously share with those at the appropriate times about your saving love, about that you um, that you would use us. You have called us to be ambassadors. You've given us all a ministry of reconciliation to share the good news of Jesus. We pray for opportunities even this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless. Have a good rest of the week.